Good morning, everyone. It is great to be worshiping with all of you who are in the church with us and for those online. Thanks for joining us as well. Would you stand and sing with us as we open our service? darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died
We are here to praise your name. We thank you for your victorious resurrection after your death on the cross and that we are free because of all that you have done, Jesus. And so we thank you for that here this morning. We glorify your name. And as we spend time in your word this morning, would you also be teaching us through those words, Lord? Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, a warm welcome. It's a wonderful day to worship our Lord together. If you got a bulletin on your way in, you'll notice there's a few announcements in there. Um, Is there anything that anybody would like to come up and highlight for us this morning? I'll just draw your attention to... um, I don't see it in here, but small groups are kicking off this week, and so we have a few groups starting tonight, and if you have forgot to sign up, there is still time, so join us for one of the groups. There's five different groups happening, two on Sunday nights, uh, one on Mondays, one on Wednesdays, and one on Thursdays, and a good variety of groups one online and some for men and for women and just uh, some focusing on study. So there's something for everyone. So I encourage you to go to the church website and, uh, and get more information if you haven't done so already. As well, Activities Committee is doing an encouragement challenge. We tried it last year and so we're going to do it again this year as we're, we're still uh, feeling a bit of isolation and lockdown especially right now as there are various people throughout our community who are struggling with COVID or isolation. And so it would be great if you could take some time and encourage people within our church family. And uh, so you can contact Bethany and uh, sign up for that. Or you can also find information on the church website. So uh, as I mentioned, you'll notice there's there's probably a lot more people online this morning as our, our pews are a little bit emptier and um, it sounds as though COVID has been going through the community a little bit more again this week and so we want to be uh, lifting up in prayer, especially those who are, are feeling ill right now and those who have to isolate because of close contacts and um, those sorts of situations. So it's good to see you all who are here that are healthy and happy and able to worship with us. That's great. Um, Jeff is going to be diving into the Sermon on the Mount for us this morning, and he isn't here, you'll notice. Um, He will be uh, 
uh, preaching from, from the screen this morning because he also has to be at home isolating in this time. So we will be, be enjoying going through the Beatitudes in a slightly different format. But to start us thinking on, on Matthew chapter 5 and what has been now called the Beatitudes, um, I found a poem by Michelle Collins that uh, has some excerpts from the Beatitudes worded in just a little bit different way, and so I want to share that for us this morning. She writes, the world thinks you've got to be big, smart, and strong, but those who follow Jesus sing a different kind of song. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not who's the best. Who wins the medal or passes the test? Instead, it's the poor in spirit, those who feel run down. These are the people God wants to give a crown. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not the ones with the smiles or the ones who can laugh for miles and miles. Instead, it's the ones who are sad, who have reason to cry. They're the ones God will comfort and with them will sigh. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not the haughty and proud or those who talk most or yell super loud. Instead, it's the meek and merciful, those who are humble and calm. Those people, God says, are kept safe in his palm. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not might makes right when sorting out rules and how to win a fight. Instead, it's a hunger for righteousness, being made right with God, and a thirst for justice, which to many seems odd. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not those who play games who say one thing and do another or call people names. Instead, it's the pure in heart, those who are honest and good, who help when they're asked and do as they should. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not the ones who start fights, who argue and bicker and throw punches at night. Instead, it's the peacemakers, the one who helps make peace. These are the ones God calls his children, at least. When Jesus had said this, he paused and looked out, As the disciples kept listening, sitting out and about, the point I am making, he said with a grin, is live for what God gives, not what the world wants to let in. You are my children. I'll show you the way. That's why you learn more, sing more, and pray. Because then you'll be ready to show people I'm real. And I think that's why each one of us is here this morning. We want to learn how to be God's people so that we can show that we have a risen and real savior to a hurting and broken world. There is a lot of chaos in our world today, especially in various parts of our country, and um, we as Christians are always confronted, and it seems especially more and more now, how do we apply the words of scripture to the way we live each and every day? And so May we ponder those things this morning as we pray and worship and study the word of God together. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we come before you. We pray for those in our community who are not feeling well, for those that are struggling with physical illness. Lord, we also pray for those who are struggling mentally and spiritually and emotionally. Father, would you be near to the brokenhearted, to those who mourn. Lord, we are told that you are close in those difficult times. May we sense your presence. Lord, we lift up our families to pray for this week. We think especially of Nate and Ari, Alice and Oliver, as they celebrate the birth of Jonah and are enjoying their first few days together as a family of five. We also lift up Walter and Janie to you, Lord, and Julie. Father, we thank you for each of them and the special place that they hold in our church family. Lord, we also pray for our mission this week, for for the ministry happening in Fiji. We pray that you'd be with each one who is doing the children's camps. Lord, we thank you that we can minister to people within our own walls, within our own community, and, and also across the world, that you've given us opportunity to do that through our tithes and offerings. So we think of those As well, we thank you for each gift and each giver, Lord, whether they're giving online or uh, dropping things off here at the church. Lord, we thank you for the different technology that you've enabled us to be able to worship together and feel that we are connected even if we are apart. Father, we also lift up our government to you. 
there is a lot of commotion these days, and uh, Lord, we are commanded to pray for our leaders, for those in authority. Father, they are in difficult circumstances with difficult decisions to make in the coming days, and there is a lot of dissension and voices that are saying completely opposite things and want very different things. And so, Lord, would you be with our governing authorities, give them wisdom, give them the discernment that they need. And Father, would you also be with us as followers of Christ? Would we serve you and honor you in ways that that you call us to? Would you give us wisdom in how to respond to what our world is is doing around us? And so we just pray, pray for our wisdom. Lord, would your Holy Spirit be leading and guiding us in, as we make decisions, Father? We thank you for this time together that we can worship. We pray for those who are joining us at home. We pray that they would feel connected and not isolated in this time. And Lord, as uh, we continue to worship you in song, would our worship be pleasing and honoring to you? And as we study your word this morning, would you give Jeff the words to say to us? Father, may our hearts be open what it is that your spirit would like to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you continue to stand as we worship?
Titus chapter 3, it says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And so as we prepare for the sermon, Jeff requested that we sing, sing this song, and let's just focus on the goodness of Christ as the king of our heart. The king of my heart 
thank you that you are never going to let us down. And even in uncertain times, we can boldly say that you are good and you are in control even in times when we don't understand what it is that you are doing. Lord, we know that you are still good. We know that you are still God. So we thank you for that. We thank you that you never change and neither does your word. So Lord, may we learn from your word this morning and may the Holy Spirit show us how to live it out each and every day. Amen. This morning, as we're dealing with a lot of sickness and, and close contacts in our community this week, um, last week we began a, a series on on what I believe is the the greatest and most brilliant and most famous sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, which is of course by Jesus in in Matthew five, six, and seven, and we're going to look at that together over the next number of weeks. But before we enter into that, I wanna. I want to uh, just read a couple of passages before we, we go into that. First, they're both, one is about Jesus and the other one is a parable that Jesus told and just leading us into what we're going to look at this morning. The first one is from, is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The other passage is from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And... Jesus told this story, it says that he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So he's speaking this parable, he's speaking this story to, to people who, who trusted in themselves, who believed in their own self-righteousness and they looked at other people with contempt. And he tells this story, he says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, Thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Last week, in, in way of introduction, we saw that Jesus is just beginning his public ministry here. He, he's going public with his ministry. He's just begun to call his disciples, and, and the fame of him is starting to spread everywhere because he's healing all these people. He's casting out demons and, and all these things that we read, and he's announcing that, that in chapter four, he's announcing from th that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we saw that, that this kingdom is like any other kingdom that we've ever seen. Uh, where every other kingdom is this e external kingdom that is out there. This kingdom that Jesus is, is preaching, that he's inviting us to, is an internal kingdom. And, and the land or the territory that Jesus wants to conquer is, is not an external land with borders and, and thrones and kingdoms. This is an internal kingdom and the land that he wants to conquer is the area of our hearts. He wants to rule in our hearts. And we looked at some passages in the New Testament that show us how Jesus wants to be the king of our hearts. And as we come to, to chapter 5 now, um, I'm going to encourage you to, to bring your Bibles, to have your Bibles open when we go through this, because 
we'll put some of the, the words that we're going through up on the screen so we can read them easily. But, but I think there's something to be said to be able to see the whole sermon when we open it in our Bibles and we see all this red writing of Jesus' words in chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. But also, um, I want us to invite Jesus, the King, through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit to, to speak to our hearts and to invite him to, to challenge us and to show us what does it mean for him to, to truly be the king of our hearts. So, so I'm going to invite you to, to have your Bibles, open your Bibles, and have pen ready to write in your margins or underline in different areas. Maybe you want to even bring a, a journal or a notepad to, to write down what, what is Jesus saying to me through this sermon on the mount. All right, we're going to read through the, the Beatitudes here this morning. Um, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, now we're going to look at the first beatitude here this morning, but before we do that, I think it's important that we see them as a whole. They're meant to be taken as a whole. You may have noticed in, in reading that there was a repetition of, of one of the promises that are given there. The first beatitude and the last one have the same promise. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Matthew is employing an ancient literary device called inclusio here, and we see this in other places in Matthew's gospel. He uses it, and the purpose of it is that you use a, a word or a phrase or a sentence, and you repeat that same uh, phrase at the beginning and the end of a, of a, of a literary um, area, so or, or a literary unit, if you will. And this is important because it, it, it shows or it marks off the boundaries of a literary unit, but it also shows us um, that inclusio, it, it shows us what the main theme is within that literary unit. So, so it, it shows us that the, that the Beatitudes, though they're different and they have different um, promises that go with each one of them, they're meant to be taken as one literary unit. It's not um, to be taken apart from each other. These promises are for the whole. Um, and what was that repeated phrase that we saw? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There it is again, the kingdom of heaven, which we talked about last week, which is the main theme here that Jesus is preaching about. He's going about preaching about the kingdom of heaven or the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And this, um, this literary unit here now, the Beatitudes are given to us to show us the, the character or the description of the one who is entered into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is, this is really important for us to see because um, these are not offices that we see other places in the Bible where we see offices like apostles or prophets or evangelists or, or elders or deacons in the Bible. Those are offices that different people have within the church. That's not what this is. This is a description of the character of the believer. This is the description of the character of the one who has entered into the kingdom of heaven. We are all to have these characters within us. And the other part that I think this shows us is the importance that um, throughout history, different um, groups or denominations have, 
have emphasized a distinction between classes within the church. We have two different classes. We have the priests or the pastors, and then we have the laity. And there's a, there's a distinction between the two. There's a difference between the two, but the, the New Testament never does this. You know, we have, um, in, in some traditions, you got St. Andrew and St. Michael and St. this and St. that. The Bible never does that. The New Testament never makes that distinction. You read in the New Testament, you'll see a, a letter that's written from Paul or, or from somebody, and it'll say, to the saints who are in Corinth, the whole body of believers, everybody who is in Christ is a saint. There is nobody that is more canonized than others. This is who the believer is. And the Beatitudes give us a picture or a description. They give us a, um, um, an understanding of the character of the one who has entered into the kingdom of heaven. So maybe, maybe the Beatitudes are, are familiar to you to some extent anyways. Blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are those who hunger and thirst, or, or blessed are the meek. Um, but I want you to imagine again, if we can imagine sitting on the, the shores of Galilee and we're listening to this Jesus who we've traveled far off to come and listen to and, and people are being healed and there's such a buzz everywhere and everybody's so excited and wondering, could this be the Messiah? And if this is the Messiah, our perception in our minds and our hopes in our minds is this external kingdom that's going to come and it's going to be set up here on earth and and the messiah is going to reign and he's going to overthrow the roman oppression in our lives that's the mentality that we would have and yet when jesus begins to speak here when jesus begins to teach um, the things that he begins with the very first beatitude that he begins with just it's going to totally totally change your perception of what you were expecting. Blessed are, right? Blessed. Yes, this is it. This is the kingdom. Blessed. God's blessing is coming down. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've been imagining. The Messiah is coming and God's blessing is coming to us. But then he says this, blessed are the poor in spirit. What? What? The poor in spirit. What on earth could this mean? Um, this is not what we've been expecting in any way. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So blessed are. Blessed are. Um, the word uh, blessed comes from the Greek word makarios. And it's an adjective and it portrays the idea of, of happiness, but it's a, it's a deep, um, continual contentment of the soul, or it's a deep, continual, not reliant on external circumstances. It's a deep, continual contentment or satisfaction that is in you. A constant state of well-being, we might say. In fact, um, God himself is described as being blessed. Psalm 68, verse 35, blessed be God. Or Psalm 72, verse 18, blessed be the Lord God. Psalm 119, verse 12, blessed art thou, O Lord. 1 Timothy 1, verse 11, Paul talks about the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Think about that for a minute. So God is by nature, we might say happy or content or fulfilled or satisfied or blessed. And those who belong to him are invited to share in his blessing or his bliss. We are blessed as believers because we have become partakers, as, as Peter said, we have become partakers in his divine nature. We are blessed because we possess the life of God by his grace through his son Jesus. The life of God has come to us and therefore we are blessed, we are happy, we are content. No matter what the world's circumstances are around us, we are content, satisfied, and happy of the soul. 
We share in his satisfaction, his contentment, his joy, in his happiness, because we are connected to an eternal sovereign. So blessed are, uh, happy are, content are, satisfied are, who? The poor in spirit. But what's, what's really important about this is, is why are they the, the ones that are blessed? What does it say? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So entering the kingdom of heaven, entering into God's kingdom, is where we find the blessing of God, where we find contentment and satisfaction in him. Happiness is found here. Blessed are those who enter into the kingdom. But what's the first thing that Jesus tells us, and, and it's really interesting when you come to the New Testament, it's really the first thing that Jesus preaches. It's the first thing. It's the initial thing entering into everything that Jesus tells us here that you need to be poor in spirit. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? And, and why does Christ start with this? Well, I believe that he starts with this because it's the, the fundamental characteristic of the Christian. It's the, the fundamental characteristic of the citizen of heaven. All other characteristics that we're going to see are going to flow out of or from this one. This is the basis of where it all begins. This is where happiness starts. The foundational beginning of everything for the kingdom of heaven is realizing that in and of myself, I possess nothing to earn myself in getting in. The, you are completely and utterly bankrupt, if you will. You are poor in spirit in standing before the glorious God in, in, in saying that anything in and of myself can get me into this kingdom of heaven. So Jesus actually says, blessed are you when you realize that there's nothing in and of yourself that can get you into this kingdom. Blessed are you when you are poor in spirit, when you realize your bankruptcy before God, when I, when I stand before God and I realize that I have nothing to give, that I have nothing in and of myself that can earn myself getting into your kingdom. You are completely and utterly bankrupt before him, poor in spirit. You have nothing to offer. You have nothing to bring, no merit to stand on in and of yourself to get in. But Jesus says, blessed are you when you realize this. Now, if you, if you think back with me to when we began the this sermon here this morning, you remember the two, the two passages that we started with, the one in, in Luke chapter 18 and the one in Matthew chapter 18. And, and the one in Matthew 18, the disciples come to Jesus and they're asking, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, you cannot even get into the kingdom of heaven unless you become like this little child as he brings a child in before them and he says you need to become like this child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven and the greatest among you is like a child the other passage that we read in luke 18 is a story you remember you remember in the beginning it said that jesus is speaking this parable to those who trusted in themselves they they believed in their own self-righteousness and they despised or they looked down on other people right so they're coming before God they're standing before God and saying like like the Pharisee in that story saying God I thank you that I'm so good that I'm not like this tax collector that I possess all these things in and of myself but you remember what Jesus said in the parable the, the tax collector comes before God and he beats his chest and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says what? I tell you the truth. This man, the tax collector, who just beat his chest and said, 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said he is the one who went down to his home justified rather than the other. You see, the whole beginning of this whole sermon, the whole beginning of this idea of entering into the kingdom of heaven, the whole idea of the blessing of God, blessed are the poor in spirit. It all begins with this realization, with this understanding that that I have nothing to give. I bring nothing. I am utterly and totally bankrupt before God in and of myself and my good works and my deeds. I need you, God. I need Jesus. I need the gospel. That's where it all began in entering the kingdom of heaven. But, but I would suggest that, that it goes even beyond that. I would suggest to you that this whole idea is the, is the, the root and the, the power of the Christian life. It is, it, is the, uh, it is the greatest characteristic that we see in the Bible of the Christian. And that is the, the humility that we live with. That our power doesn't come from our good works, our strength and what I can do. Our power is, is a constant living in the acknowledgement that I need to be connected to the vine. I need Jesus every hour. I need thee. Every revival and every true move of God. I think this is this is the foundation because, because we we acknowledge that I'm I'm poor in spirit. I I need Jesus to work in me and through me to do anything and and we read about these revivals what is the what's the foundation that they're always built upon it's the prayer of the people so uh, as we begin this sermon let us be reminded that that blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are those who come before God with nothing to offer but but a whole lot to receive and we're going to see that next is is God can fill you up if you empty yourself first. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so good. We thank you that even though we have nothing to give, nothing to bring, you say, blessed are you because we have nothing to give we can receive from you. So we just want to offer ourselves to you um, to be used by you in our, in our community, in our world for your glory. So Father, we are... We are wanting to be humble. We want to be filled with you by your spirit, by your love, by your strength in order to use us for your glory. So we just offer ourselves to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's respond with our closing song, The Blessing. Stand.
thank you that you are with us, that you are for us, and Lord, that there is nothing we can do to earn your love, but God, you love us unconditionally, only through your goodness and your grace, so we thank you, and may we begin another week with that gratitude, knowing that we are bankrupt before you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and how you love us. Amen. Go in peace.